Good afternoon, everybody. It is great to see how many of you have joined us here today, and welcome to this webinar hosted today by CNK. The speaker today is Jerome Somolinsky, Market Industry Manager Automotive at CNK. Jerome is currently Automotive Segment Leader for CNK, graduated from Esther Belfort, France, with a micromechanics background. He's been in the, in the connector and switches industry for over 25 years. He joined CNK in 2002, managing different product lines and responsibilities before moving last year to market management, focusing on CSK expertise in automotive and automotive interiors in particular. We do encourage you to ask plenty of questions at any point during the webinar. Please type in your questions into the Q&A box you will find at the bottom of the screen. At the end of the presentation, we will present your questions and answer as many as possible. It is an absolute pleasure to have Jerome with us today, and I would like to warmly welcome him now to take control and begin the session. Well, thank you for that introduction. Hello to everybody. Thank you for um, all our customers and uh, people attending this uh, webinar. So I'm going to go through today through the different aspects of uh, switch haptic and sound for, for the HMI, um, where we are today and where we, where we are going. So I'll start with a short introduction about CNK, who we are, what we do, and then move directly to the subject with the uh, car interior evolution, the impact on the switches, how do we adapt those switches to uh, today's needs, um, the need for merging uh, the technologies, and going to go through end of that presentation with some uh, concepts and proposals for the new seamless integration. So, CNK, who we are? Well, First, um, we have over 24,000 customers worldwide, um, and that includes some of our distributors' uh, network uh, with over 50 of them, uh, including the biggest one and some local ones whenever it is necessary. We have 19 different product families. Um, we definitely have the largest and deepest range of switches within the industry uh, with over 50,000 different part numbers. Um, and with uh, 92 years of, of expertise, um, we can serve a lot of requirements regarding those switches. We are in the, in the Americas, in the MEA and Asia, uh, with eight locations uh, worldwide. What it means is we can serve um, the different projects locally. Uh, we have the structure customer service, so you have somebody that can answer your questions at your, um, within your time frame. Uh, we also have the, the, the possibility to follow up a project that would be, let's say, designed in the U.S., uh, managed by Europe, and uh, being manufactured in Asia. You have every time the necessary local support for your projects. Different type of proposals for, for our uh, products, catalog products, as I said, a lot of different switches. A large part of it are tactile switches. We even have a part um, on DCEP connectors, which are for aerospace, um, basically, and some smart card connectors also for the payment industry. We can do variants of these products that includes different uh, uh, characteristics than the standards and or wire harness or custom mountings which are available. And then move up the ladder to purpose build type of uh, switches that would include some different packaging and different uh, proposals and up to modules uh, including some of these, uh, some of the switches or multifunction switches or standalone assemblies. To make things clear, um, we don't want to become a tier one, right? Um, our customers do that better than we do. The aim here of the modules is really to be able to offer a different solution that would be more cost effective in terms of installation cost and or bring a new solution on board. Uh, the target here is not to be able to propose some modules directly to the OEM. So, um, this being said, um, let's start with the evolution of what we've seen in, uh, in the car industry. Well, yeah, it was better before. We all know that, right? Um, when you looked 50, 60, 70 years ago, um, you had one object, 
one function. A radio was a radio. Okay, you had two buttons, the volume and the tuner, and that was it. So it's something that was obvious that you would remember. Right? TV was a TV, refrigerator was a refrigerator, easy to operate. You knew what you had to do. It was really obvious. And it was reflecting in, in the car interior, right? If you look at that picture here, um, nice car though, um, you could at first glance identify what are the functions, the odometer, the clock, the radio, um, the air conditioning, the gear shifting, right? You don't have different things and okay, that's the lever. It's here. You can operate it. It's very easy. So everything can be identified at first glance. Then technology evolved. So the aim of the car makers was to get more functions into, into the car. Okay. It was the era when you prove that you know about the technology by putting some more and more functions into the car. And it led to situations where you have rows and rows of buttons into that. It looks, yeah, it looks really strong, but how do you manage, you know, uh, when, when you're driving to, to get used to it, right? As I said, it's an interface you remember. Well, you'd better remember that because with all these buttons, uh, it even led to some tentatives on, on the picture below um, that try to be more ergonomic, um, but it led to a pretty odd design and not that ergonomic. So really the important thing at that time was to add more feature. It would prove that the car was on the technological point um, up to date. And then, yeah, certainly customer feedback went on that. It was a, a bit too much for that. So the other application outside of, of the automotive world made it through the car interior, multifunction modules, organic design, controllers, um, all the different devices that you could find in the consumer world drove also some of those into, into the car interior. It was trying to look intuitive, uh, but it's still forcing technology to fit into, into the interior of the car, right? Um, it reminds me of, of a personal story that happened. I used to have a Alfa Romeo Sprint, right? Very basic car. Nice car, though. And, and I remember that I was driving this car for a whole afternoon. Um, there was like, I don't, I don't remember, but not more than five or six different buttons in that car, right? No power steering, nothing. And by the evening, I was supposed to pick up a car at the rental. So came directly from my drive-in to the rental agency, pick up the car. It was an ODA4, RS line and everything. Just opened the door, and for a couple of seconds, I sat in the car, and I was like, what am I supposed to do? You know, and, and I just realized that you, know, you plug in the key, just hit the button, and there you go. But it just to illustrate that from a simple, obvious object in the interior to a multifunction buttons that looks like a, 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 the, the cockpit of an airplane, you're like... Okay, um, where where is everything, right? So it's it's again trying to look intuitive, but it's still some of the technology that is put it into the top, into the cockpit. So we're still in that we were still in that trend of yeah, we need to show that we master the technology, not only the engine, not only the car, not only the design, but what's inside that car. And we're reaching the era of the displays as the ultimate interface. Um, the screens do bring partial answer to uh, that ease of, uh, uh, of use, the all-in-one solution and simplicity of use, but is it really easier, right? Um, when you think about older people, when, um, you know, there was an example also recently, um, a German court ruling on a Tesla case um, a person had an accident uh, trying to change the wiper speed through the screen. And it, it just illustrates that, that some of the things 
can be dealt with screens, some others still need the good old solutions within the interior of the car. And I'll come, certainly come back to that. So, yes, those screens, they're replacing, as I said, aerospace-like interiors, um, but some functions still need the good old interface. And, you know, in the end, it's, it's really about touch and feel. We're, we're humans, right? Remember that we're humans using a, a, a system, and, and we have some, some physical uh, um, characteristics like the touch and the feel which is still needed. What's the impact on those switches? Well, we're talking here uh, about the electromechanical switches, the ones which are used underneath the buttons uh, that will give the feedback, the haptic and the sound feedback to the user. The most obvious impact for those switches is the number of switches used uh, within the interior, specifically with the, uh, uh, with the screens. Um, we are accustomed now to that, uh, that particular touch with the smartphones, with the tablets, and uh, even screens on refrigerators, on whatever you name it. We all are accustomed to it. The younger ones are even more accustomed to it than, than we are, um, and that's part of the uh, evolution. But as we are putting more and more functions into into the cars, you multiply the contact point within the interior, and some of them cannot be managed by screens. Um, it's mostly a question of security. Putting your eyes off the road when you drive in um, is dangerous, can be dangerous, and in some situations, uh, it's even more dangerous. It, it works fine maybe when you're in a 30-kilometer zone, but when you drive over 200 on the Autobahn, it just doesn't work. So some functions like the window lifters, uh, everything which is on the steering wheel and steering columns, uh, the seat adjustment, um, the infotainment. Okay, the infotainment can be managed through the screen, but still, again, if I take the situation you're on highway um, and there's a lot of traffic, trying to manage the radio or your USB key through only the screens with one hand off the wheel can be dangerous. Um, gear shift pedals, uh, shifters for um, internal combustion engines only, uh, APB and some other additional functions like the on-off for the primitive ADAS functions you have in a car needs to have more of a traditional interface. You, for these functions, you cannot have like two or three submenus before you go to, to the function. So what four switches? Well, Again, underneath those buttons, there is, there's more one or, or, or more switches. Uh, some car makers uh, choose to go for some cost-effective solutions using rubber mats, um, which gives you that long travel kind of mushy feeling that you can have very soft sound, very long travel. But some others made the choice of tech switches uh, that became over the years uh, the interior signature. And for these people, um, the need is to get a consistent feel and sound of the switches within the interior. Let's make it clear. It doesn't serve any other purpose than having the car at the dealership, right? And I'm sorry to say, but it's a man thing. You enter the dealership, you get into the car, clunk the door, and what we do? We start playing with the buttons. We all do that. Right, so in 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 the quietest of of the uh, of the dealership, it is important to have the same feel and sound within the interior. Again, when you drive over 200 on the autobahn, the radio on and the kids yelling in the back seat, you don't care about the sound of the switches, right? But the first approach to the car is needs to be a qualitative one and. After spending millions on the, the sound of the engine, the sound of the doors, the trunk, um, the feel and the sound of the buttons now are part of the design and the signature of the cars. So we have, I would say today in the world, around three or four different signatures, some particular to a, a car maker, some others more, more generic. Um, but there's, there's a move to that to get into, uh, into that for, for the car makers. So 
So it brings new challenge um, to uh, to tech switches. The first one is to to be able to reach an equal feel and sound for all the functions within the cockpit, right? Uh, the second challenge to be able to adapt to diff the, the different signature. Um, the rise of the lifetime due to passive haptics. I'm going to come back to that a little bit later. And the cost also, which is related to the volumes, um, by adapting standard switches to uh, to the functions and or to the location of, of those switches. So how do we do that? Well, let's start with the basics here um, and with the definition of what is a tax switch. The first thing is the over-molded circuit, right? Um, a bit of metal um, over-molded into plastics, metal dome, an actuator that can be anything from hard actuator, hard plastic to silicon to uh, a PDM compound, whatever. Um, and a top cage to close the system and guarantee uh, the functioning, the dimensions, and the, uh, the protection degrees. You have here a typical um, force displacement curve for a tech switch because it's what is mostly used for the, uh, for the HMIs. So what you see in here um, on, on, on this particular here is you start to push on switch. So you increase the force, you reach the peak here, and the dome, the metal dome collapses. And then you get the electrical contact. You continue to push, and then you release. And that's the force of the dome popping back up. So if we can... Get a short definition. I would say the feel is given by the actuation force, right? How much you push on that. The return force, which is the force at which the domes pops back. The travel, how long did you need to push? The curve, a flatter curve will have a different feeling than, than a more uh, a rapid one. The slope of that curve, uh, namely, it's the speed at which the dome collapses and that that has also an impact on, on the field for, for the switches. The sound is managed uh, by different factors, but, but mainly with the dome and the actuator. How we shape the dome, the nature of the actuator, the shape of those actuators do have a great impact on the final uh, result for the switch. This being said, the integration um, is also a big part of, of the end result. Um, we can manufacture the best tech switches in the world um, if the integration has not been taken care of before, it can sound totally different, right? To get an analogy with, with high fidelity, um, we produce speakers, we don't produce cabinets. And the same speaker in different cabinets using a wood, concrete carbon um, cabinets will have a different sound in the end, depending on the integration. And it's exactly the same thing here. I remember a case where I had one of our salesperson come into me uh, and, and having, putting, putting an application on the table. So, oh, yeah, we need to do something on the switch. Like, okay. And you start to open that application and what you find inside that there's a huge chamber made of plastics that resonates like hell. So oh, it's too loud. We need to do something. Yeah, okay. Tr start to fill in that cavity with with uh, um, you know sound absorbing material, and and you'll certainly get a better result than 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 the whole thing. It's easier. It's less costly than changing a switch. Um, so yeah, again, the integration is is a big part of the final result. And OEMs usually specifies the end application, not necessarily the components by themselves. So it's, it's a common work that needs to be done between the switch manufacturer and, and the customer to determine what's going to be the impact of the switch when it's finally integrated. And uh, that's also why we, we do have a lot of variants and, and a large range of variants to accommodate the different cases that we've seen um, in all those years. So we developed a unique manufacturing know-how um, to be able to answer the different haptic, the click feeling, and the acoustic the sound of those switches, right? We have the ability with our semi-anechoic chamber to measure 
the sound uh, in our in our lab and also the uh, force displacement curves also in our labs we can make measurements in sound pressure in frequencies in sonar um, which is the perceived sound volume so all these three different type of measures can be can be done and again on the switch alone and on the full module because the integration is of the essence for those uh, for those switches some of the additional requirements uh, that, that we're seeing on switches, shorter travel. Again, it's led by, by the consumer industry and, and what we're seeing on, on our smartphones and, and daily life. From the usage of rubber mats with those long travel, to typically 1.3, 1.4 millimeter, uh, we're getting closer to 2.3 millimeter. And it does have an impact. It has an impact on the sound. That's the first thing. Um, without any work around a tech switch like this with a short travel will have a high click sound, right? You'll hear the click click into that. Um, to adapt and to reach the similar haptic and sound to the rubber, it takes a bit of work to, uh, to reach that. <coughs> it also, sir, it also poses a, a, another challenge. Um, not only for us, but, but for our customers, is the integration, again, uh, with shorter travel usually means also shorter tolerances. And shorter tolerances um, are means usually reduced tolerances on the plastics and on the molds, and it also means cost involved into that. So that move is not that easy within the, uh, within the industry. We've seen cases where yeah, shorter travel, fine, but but how do I manage all my my tolerances within within the system? Also, adding um, longer life for passive haptic surfaces and multi-purpose uh, interface um, self-diagnosis feature. It's not totally related to the haptic and sound, but it's it's a requirement um, that we're seeing more and more uh, to be integrated. So. Uh, you need to get some different features into the text, which is with and still respecting the right haptic and sound. So in terms of the text, uh, we have a lot of variants, um, over 300 with high clicks to soft sound signature. Uh, the life of extended life of, of some of our switches up to 10 million cycles. Um, well, yeah, you have to. Um, before that, you can imagine that you have one button, one switch underneath. Now you have situations where you have a row that represents four buttons and you only have one switch below that bar of, uh, of, uh, of actuation. So you need to multiply it by four. Detect versions, um, SPDT, which are suitable for, for cell diagnosis, um, large choice of travel range, the set point from 0.3 to uh, 1.3 millimeter, and some reduced tolerance specific additions to answer that, uh, that question, those questions on, on the tolerancing. We also had to reduce our own tolerancing uh, to, to our switches to be able to, uh, to integrate this for our customers. Snap and detect switches, um, silent actuation is, is one big topic. Um, and specifically, I'm going to come back to that with, with the new structure of the electrical vehicles, um, the rise of semi-autonomous driving level two, level three. Um, there, there's a huge change within the interiors, particularly on the seat sides. Not only the, uh, um, the dashboard is changing with screens and everything, but also the interior and the, the interior management is, is, is changing a lot these days. Seat adjustment modules, um, we do offer some high power versions. And uh, why do I mention that is that it can be, um, well, for, at first it was designed to, to get rid of the relays uh, managing the motors of, of the seat, right? So we were driving directly the current and the power through the switch. Um, to do that, there, we use metal blades and silver pellets. To, and, and the end result is that we cannot change the haptic and sound for it, right? It is what it is. It is usually high click, but because of the power handling, you really have little choices when you want to adapt these. 
there's a trend that we're seeing where the, the power management of the seats can be combined with the window lifters and then you can come back to the usage of the low current versions and here we're back to what we know with tax and the snaps and the adaptations of those products to the requirement. Let's move to the merge of, of the technologies. We're not all equal. As I said, screens are invading the cockpit. They look cool, right? But they start to show some flaws. And, and it's about us humans. Remember that, right? First, not everybody loves the, 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 the usage of the screen. I'm, you know, half-half using screens in a car, to be honest. Um, some of the functions cannot be just transferred to the screens. Um, the ATIS uh, on-off uh, function and for questions of security, once again, uh, it's hard to, to, to allow some of the functions to, to, to be driven only by, by screens. Other problem is the car life. Usually, yeah, it's estimated 10, 15 years. Yeah, I know. Some people change car every year, every two years. Okay, for those people, fine. But some others uh, do keep their cars for a long time. So how do we manage the user experience obsolescence? We're changing a phone every year, every two years, because there's a new screen, because there's a new animation, because it's a brighter thing. There are, there are different uh, um, uh, applications into that. Okay, you can certainly manage that through reprogramming, but still, the definition of the screen, you know, after a few years, you're like, yeah, but it's cool. I wanted like 4K on my screen and everything. How do you manage that? You take the screen, you take the whole dashboard out to get the screen off? No way, right? I don't know if you've ever seen how a, a dashboard is, is put into a car, but you don't want it out at no cost, right? It's, it's no way you do that. And, and the, the total cost of that operation can be, can be all. We're all aging, right? Um, our own interface to the world is de de deteriorates as we age. The vision gets narrower. The touch is less sensitive. The hearing is, is reduced. Mobility, um, the mobility of the neck for, for older people is also reduced. So how do you cope with that, with, with all the, this, the, these different screens that you have in there? And again, based on personal experience, how, do you, how many times do you get a rental car? You enter the car and you spend like two minutes trying to uh, pair your phone with the car interface. You spend times to look for simple functions or you have all of a sudden the sound, you don't know where that comes from and you're trying to look through the different menus, uh, uh, trying to stop the whole thing. Um, with, with the different interfaces that we're, that we're seeing, even if we are getting used to it, I'm personally a, at home, I'm a Mac user. At work, window user. My phone is Google interface. I'm getting used to those interfaces. And why those interfaces are not getting used to me, right? Uh, we're still in, in, in the realm of, of the technologies going through us and not serving us. It's, it's, it's a shortcut, but it's, it's certainly uh, partly true for that. Um, so all these, these new interfaces, they, again, they look cool and everything, but, but if you look really at the ergonomics of, of those solutions, it's not as simple as it seems. But this being said, it's here to stay, right? We cannot go backward. Um, even if uh, the electron mechanical switches um, still have the best ratio uh, between the performance cost and integration f flexibility, the future of those switches in the HMI is going through the merge of technologies. Uh, we cannot stay only on the electron mechanical. First, for the passive haptics, right, which would be a combination of electron mechanical switches with multifunction surfaces, make it capacitive, make it something else. Active haptics which is based today on different technologies. Um, the next speaker for this, uh, for this webinar will, will, will talk about it much better than I do. Uh, electromagnetic and also switches under the dashboard, under fabric um, to get you know, uh, solutions for, for the designers 
uh, some of those crazy ideas and, and prototypes that we're seeing at different shows, which are totally, you know, you enter the car, it's, it's hardly that you can identify the steering wheel and, and get into the seat, but, uh, but it's part, it's part of the game. And again, all this is driven by, by the new interior design specifically for the electrical vehicles, um, with a flat floor. Um, you can easily imagine that you can integrate in the high-end cars, for example, some uh, business-like seat, okay, um, where you can sleep in there um, either on the passenger uh, seat or in the back seats. And for this, then you need to integrate also another central console with other functions, other interfaces. Um, all this is changing uh, within within those interiors. Also, the level two, level three uh, autonomous, autonomous, or let's say semi-autonomous driving, uh, will lead to have uh, uh, different solutions, um, but still some controls. I mentioned uh, the detection of this of the seat. Um, there are uh, situations that I've seen a Mercedes truck video where, when the driver hits a button to be on semi-autonomous semi driving. The seat goes backward 45 degrees to get in some space. And if he wants to get back to manual driving, then he hits again the button and the seat moves back. So you need to know where that seat is in a silent environment. It's even more, more important for the electrical vehicles because it's silent in there, right? You don't hear the engines. The only thing you hear is are, are the um, the tires on the road, right? So everything needs to be to be smooth and cool and adapted to this electrical clean environment of the electrical vehicles and and the images that those vehicles bring on the market. Some of the new proposals for for the integration. Um, I'll show you here three different concepts and, and products that we're working on. Let's start with passive haptics. Okay, nothing new. Um, there are solutions today on the, on, on the market, but uh, the way we approach that is um, we are developing a hollow structure um, that would have possibly illumination and active touch surface. The benefit of a solution like that um, would be that you can integrate this the, the electronics in that hollow surface, allow the illumination, whether it's a film, whether it's LEDs, it's, it, these are different choices and there are different solutions to, to allow that. Passive haptics, um, I remember that when we started to talk about it, we were talking about putting passive haptics behind screens. Um, multiple challenge around that. First one is, the weight of the screen. How do you make sure that you don't activate extendedly or through vibrations that you don't activate the switch? So there were a lot of things and, and one of our customer made a working prototype of this. They manage you know, the weight, the, uh, the, the travel and, and, and everything. But ultimately um, there was one issue is how do you make sure that you lock and unlock the screen as you bring your finger towards the screen. Is, is the system of the car uh, fast enough to make the calculation that you're going to hit the screen at that precise moment and that you can unlock the screen? So there's always a delay between your action and the reaction of, of the system plus the electromechanical. So it was, it was not something that, that flew off. Um, but passive haptics are really well adapted to, uh, I would say, short row of, of buttons, like up to three, four, for um, rear view mirrors. It's also adapted for steering wheels. Um, you can imagine that into window lifters, but that's a bit, a bit more complex. Uh, but for steering wheel, that would, be, that would certainly be a, a good solution um, because it's thinner, than the module, so you say space also into into the steering wheel, and um, it's easier to customize, right? Uh, the steering wheel modules, when you look at what you have today uh, on those steering wheels, it changes with every model. It changes with every um, options that you get into the car. So every time uh, when you do that, 
it's different buttons, it's different graphics, it means tooling, it means development times uh, for for the part, for the tooling, for the approval. Um, it's a fairly long process for something which is yeah, important, but not that important in the meantime. So moving to modules like this uh, that would integrate, uh, let's, let's imagine, capacitive films uh, would certainly be easier and cheaper to, uh, to customize for the different models and for the different options than the traditional mechanical assembly that we're seeing today. Second uh, concept that uh, we are working on, a smart controller hub. Uh, I mentioned earlier on that, yeah, infotainment can be managed through screens. Yeah, true. Um, but namely, when you pay 100000 or more for a car and you enter it, and again, it's a, it's a man thing, we need to play with something, right? You enter the car, you need to play with something. And the screen is not that mm, satisfactory. Um, so we're, we're certainly seeing questions around getting back to a controller for some of the functions of the car. Uh, the idea here is to have a high quality, or high perceived quality for that for that controller. Um, to make another analogy uh, with with high fidelity, it's like those um, amplifier volume buttons that you that has that silky smooth movement, and you like you, you know when you turn the volume off, you're like, oh yeah, I know why I paid that much. You know, it did give you that that sense of of. I paid what it, you know, it's worth paying for it. Um, into that, the context adaptive joystick, as we call it, uh, would have different features. And again, it's, it's a merge of different technologies. Um, the rotary functions would allow to have different indexing depending on the menus and depending on the number of icons you have to drive on screen. Um, it would also allow different torques um, depending on the context, namely the speed. Again, if you're driving in a 30 kilometer zone, maybe you need lower torque. It's easier to manage, um, your interface. And when you're back on the no limit, uh, speed in the, in the autobahn, and then you need something stronger to make sure that every time you turn that thing, you're sure of what you're, you're doing. Also, the top surface will integrate active haptic, also, depending on the context, you can have a higher or lower or lower click. So this has the advantage of being adaptive to the different situations while still driving the same the same interfaces, but also having one component by quote unquote simply programming the different haptics and sounds for the different card makers uh, without again tooling involved or too much tooling involved, a lot of requalification, the same component would be able to adapt to different situations um, with, with this keeping in mind the simplicity of use. How do we make sure that we guarantee the feedback to the user in total security? And the last concept uh, that we're working on are switches behind the dash. Um, Namely, we're putting text switch in the skin of, of underneath the skin of the dashboard. Um, we've been working on that for a few months now. Um, I would say the proof of concept is done. Basically, took a text switch, put it there. Well, it worked. Okay, yeah, there's some adaptations which are needed, but it, it works. It really works. Um, we're now at a stage where we have to find what is the what are the right dimensions for, for a switch like that, including the illumination? Um, because it needs to be large enough to accommodate the finger, because we still have fingers, right? So there, there's a limit to, uh, to the size that we can use. And, um, and also, it, it, it can't be too big, because when you integrate it into the dashboard, um, it needs to be totally flat. You need you, you're not allowed to see a, a, a dent into into the dashboard. Um, so we we're there with that, uh, trying some of uh, some prototypes uh, uh, around that. Um, that would allow definitely some of the uh, 
new interiors to to integrate that. So again, it's a combination of those of those different uh, uh, solutions that that we have today. Um, the, evol- the natural evolution from the past switches where you have many buttons, one switch underneath that, to merging some of the technologies out of our boundaries, um, but adapting to those new interiors. Again, I'm coming back to uh, the seat controls, the seat detection. Uh, it's it's very important that uh, that it's it's also part of the final signature of the car. Yes, there are integration issues. Yeah, there are cost issues also related to that. Um, but what we're working on is really to get the final installation cost as reduced as possible while still respecting some of the OEM requirements uh, that we're seeing and that we all are going through. So with over 90 years of expertise, um, we, we were able to offer a large range of suite solutions for the HMI vehicle access systems, also on seats, as I mentioned, um, from standard components to value-added modules. Um, well, we can offer solutions for, for, the, uh, for the different uh, systems. Um, and that move from our existing know-how, our base um, work on of the electromechanics, stamping, molding, over-molding, and assembly, um, we're merging now these with new solutions to really get into those future thinking about the automotive and need to automotive interior. So whether you need a specific information on products and the development, or uh, you, you think we can help with haptic and sound on, on your application uh, or simply submit a project, well, you can feel free to check our website or to contact me at the following address that will uh, stay on that screen afterwards. So, thank you for your attention. I appreciate uh, your your attendance to this webinar, and I think that now we can come back to the question section. Thank you very much for that. That was excellent. Um, I've got a. I'll start with the Q and A session for you. So, first question: um, Is cost still a big driver for switches or other factors coming into play? Um, cost is is. Uh, comes into play when when you don't have uh, a specific requirements. Um, clearly, a tax switch is a tax switch. It clicks. If you don't care about that click, then yeah, cost is of the essence. When it starts to when you start to have specific requirements, as I mentioned, on on the sound, on the curve, and on the level of sound that you need, and uh, the uh, the shape of the sound, higher click, softer click, you know, higher mid frequencies or low frequencies. Um, yeah, it does come into play for the developments. Fortunately, so far, uh, we are able, because we already have a large range of solutions, we're able to manage that within, I would say, existing components and with, you know, variations of, the, of those components without too much cost involved. Thank you, Jerome. Um, next question for you. Um, which countries are CNK currently active in with your customers? Customers uh, worldwide, all EMEA, uh, US, Canada, um, and all over Asia, China. Um, not in Japan, though, but um, all over Asia. Okay, thank you. Um, I've got a three-parter question here from Vitali. Hello, my name is Vitali from BCS ASI Germany. I have a question about K- KSCXA40JLFS microswitch. Okay. Right. So first, how do you reach 1 million cycles? Okay. Um, we've reached a million cycle by the integration. Um, to get a little bit more specific on the details, we changed the inside from the standard KSC series um, to get a flatter surface. Um, this came from the um, from the how do you call that um, dome sheets, right? Uh, dome sheets usually work, uh, or individual dome on PCBs, they work on a flat surface and they have a very long lifetime. So we've adapted the interior of the switch to have as flat as possible as, as actuation surface to avoid any 
particular stress point on the dome. Um, then we worked on shaping the dome through the stamping, the tooling, the tolerances on the tooling, uh, the different shapes uh, that we could that, that we could uh, do in that. Also, a lot of work on the material itself, the quality of the material, how do we master that, and the combination of that along with the interface being the um, silicon that we're using um, made it able to reach to reach a million cycle. Okay, thank you. Second part, could a haptic be adjusted by our customer requirements? Yes, it can to a certain limit. Um, as I would say, all technologies, there's always compromises. <laughs> um, usually the compromises in between the force, the haptic, uh, the sound, the travel, um, but we usually manage to, to get it all in one. Okay, third part, can you adjust sound? Yes, yes. Um, namely, uh, we can adjust sound by changing some of the components. Uh, if you take the bass, uh, which is the KSC, um, we have one with a high click uh, for the uh, Ingolstadt band. Um, and we can, by changing the actuator within the same structure, um, get to the Wolfsburg sound, uh, with within the same within the same structure. Okay, thank you, Jerome. Um, next question for you: Any major any major changes coming from Jerome's point of view that could affect switch haptic and sound? I would say today it's driven by by the consumer industry, um, just just like the interfaces. Um, it's it's really. What we're seeing and what we're using today on our on very everyday life reflects in, in the car interior. Um, so we're, we're today at a, at a point where there are, there are two things. First, as I mentioned, shorter travel uh, that we're seeing on, on our everyday life with, with the, the mobile phones, the TVs and everything. Um, and, and also some OEMs starting to yeah, take care about the, their sound signature. So it does affect the, the haptic and sound on switches. Ultimately, uh, let, let's make it clear, uh, when we're going to move to level five, fully autonomous driving vehicles, switches, at least tax switches, will disappear, right? It's going to be replaced by uh, uh, voice recognition, gesture recognition. Um, today, it's it's progressing. It's progressing at fast pace uh, with artificial intelligence and everything. Yeah, fine. Uh, but we're not there yet. Um, you know, for voice recognition, um, the level of voice you have, the different accents uh, can can really uh, be, be difficult to manage. Today, in, the, in today's car environment, gesture is hard to control also. And again, Today, those two technologies are, you need to get used to it, okay? You need to, to, to put precise voice commands. You need to put a precise gesture to do something. It's not natural. It's not my gesture and the car understands it. Uh -uh. It's not, it doesn't work like that. So it's moving and it's going to evolve to uh, when we reach that level five uh, fully autonomous driving, which is planned somewhere 2030, 20. We'll see when it really happens, um, and and there the, these will disappear. But but so far, it's for me. I think I, I see it mostly driven by by the consumer industry. In fact, thank you, Jerome. Um, next question for you: Could UX UX be continuously updated via software regarding the car life problem? Um, yeah, part of it. But again, um, it, it's also the definition of those screens. It, it, just taking that example, um, we all had um, L plasma. We started with plasma TV, moved to LEDs, moved to high definition. Now we're at 4K. How do you manage that? Right. Uh, there's, there's certainly answers. Um, I'm, I'm not fully aware of, of all the technologies, um, but, but I just raised the question is, is when, when I see some of the interiors, which are just, you know, on the dashboard, it's half of the dashboard, which is screen. I'm like, mm, maintenance of that, Yuck. that's going to be costly, right? That's Thank my only remark here.
Thank you very much. Um, next question for you. Uh, the future of HMI and merging tech, how far off is it from being reality or do some cars already have this? Some cars already have this or part of it. Um, we're, we're seeing solutions today being developed. Uh, but again, they're, they're, they're using one particular technology for one function. Um, and, and so far, I haven't seen things that would, you know, um, be as flexible as what we're working on. Um, we're talking about some of the solutions I presented, which we're talking certainly a year from now, um, not more, for the first, you know, testing and feedbacks. Okay, thank you very much. Um, next question for you. Where would, where would the smart controller hub most likely sit in the vehicle? Most probably central armrest. Um, that would be that would be the certainly the easiest uh, location. Um, at the beginning, we thought about having a controller that you could put anywhere into onto screens, uh, just like this this uh, Microsoft controller you have for the large surface screens. Uh, but it's not a good idea. Um, having something, you know, moving into the car, um, and that would fly out in case of collision. Mm -mm, no, not a good idea. So it needs to be fixed and certainly in a central armrest. Okay. Thank you, Jerome. Um, next question for you. How long has Jerome been in industry? Thanks for a great presentation. Well, I've been in that industry for, yeah, something like 25 years, including connectors and, and switches. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Uh, next question for you. Regarding smart control hub, what would be supplied parts from C&K? Current concept is supplying whole control module, or will it be new te technology inside of it? Um, there would be some, some new technology inside of it. Um, as I said, we, we, we don't, we certainly don't want to become a tier one, so there's, there's going to be part of, of that. We would supply the mechanical um, integration of, of those different technologies, and then the final integration, final decorations and things uh, would be provided by, by our customers. Um, we, we don't want to get into that. Okay, thank you very much. Um, okay, I've got a final question for you. How is some... Um, uh, commoditization of automobiles affecting switch consumption in OEM equipment with repairs, replacement, total life cycle management? Um, okay, can you, can you repeat that one? Um, how is the commoditization of automobiles affected switch consumption in OEM equipment with repairs, replacement, and total life cycle management? Well, I would say usually switches are not the weakest point within, within, the, uh, within the systems. Um, we're, we're at the level today where, as I mentioned, where we can reach up to 10 million cycles. So I guess, I guess the car will be down before, before the switches. Um, but uh, I said what, what affects most the uh, the consumption and the commoditization of of the switches within within the car industry is is those changing of of interfaces and of technologies uh, to that. Um, we're 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 seeing a trend of more and more details. Uh, we we have a lot of requests from our customers for you know that need of integration and question and answers uh being taken more and more seriously within within the industry so yeah there's still a part and as said uh there's still a part of the car makers who you know put an electrical point and and end of story and they, they don't care about it how it sounds what it is fine with it as long as it costs nothing they're they're fine with it some others do cares and it's and it's a different dialogue that that would that would start here Thank you very much, Jerome. Um, I'm just going to finish with somebody who was kind enough to write. Great webinar, Jerome. Detailed and engaging. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, I would like to say a big thank you to Jerome from CNK today for an excellent presentation. Absolutely superb. And uh, uh, a great Q&A with the questions that he answered. Um,
the webinar today will be on demand for you to all to rewatch as well. Um, thank you very much to everybody for attending. And once again, a big thank, thank you, you to Jerome from CNK for a superb webinar today. Um, ladies and gentlemen, um, we do look forward to seeing you all at our next We Automotive webinar. Thank you all and have a great day. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Goodbye. Thank you, Jerome. Take care.